Hello, and welcome to Keep the Channel Open, a podcast featuring conversations with artists, writers, and curators. My name is Mike Sakasagawa, and this is episode 51. Today's guest is Mari Ness. Hey, folks. So before we get started with this week's conversation, I wanted to give a quick shout out to the Medium Festival of Photography, which is going on this week, starting tomorrow, Thursday, October 26th, and going through Sunday, October 29th. Um, If you've been listening for a while, then you may recall that I talked with Scott B. Davis, the executive director of Medium. Uh, That was back in episode 44. So if you'd like to get some more info about the event and how it came about, definitely go check that out. And I'll put a link in the show notes for that. And if you're in the San Diego area this weekend, please do come check out Medium. It's one of my favorite events of the whole year, and I will be there, so you can come find me and say hi. So, this week's guest is writer Mari Ness. Mari's short fiction and poetry have appeared in numerous print and online publications, including Tor.com, Clark's World, Lightspeed, Fireside, Apex Magazine, Daily Science Fiction, Nightmare, Strange Horizons, Uncanny, and Fantasy, and I've linked a few examples of her work in the show notes. She also recently published her novella-length poem, Through Immortal Shadows Singing, which is a retelling of the Trojan War from Helen's perspective, and I put a link in the show notes for that as well. Mari is a regular contributor to Tor.com and was nominated for a Stabby Award for Best Related Work for her Disney Read Watch series there. Her poetry has also been nominated for the Riesling and Dwarf Stars Awards. I uh, was introduced to her work by a mutual friend, Jose Iriarte, who, um, if you'll recall, I spoke with in episode 23. And um, I found myself very drawn in by her stories and poems, so I was very pleased to get the chance to talk with her. So let's jump in then. As always, if you're on Twitter, you can use the hashtag ChannelOpenPod to join in the conversation. And now here's my conversation with Mari Ness. Sort of thinking about, um, you know, your work and why I wanted to talk to you. Um, I thought it was interesting. I got to know you uh, through a a mutual acquaintance of of ours, um, Joe Iriarte. Um, Mm -hmm. Introduced us on Twitter and... um, and that was what sort of prompted me to look up your your work. Um, I can't claim to have read everything that you've uh, published, but but I've I've gone through and read a, a you know a good number of uh, of your short stories. And um, I actually just recently, uh, yesterday, I started reading um, your your new. Um, I'm not sure if it's a novella exactly. It's sort of novella length, but it seems to be uh, uh, like sort of a, a, a long poem um, or a series of poems. The through the oh gosh the title is leaving my head through the shadows singing is that right yeah it's through immortal shadows singing and that started out as one small poem that got significantly out of control and out of hand and then ended up being about 185 pages in manuscript (laughs) uh so it which I don't usually do um, as enthusiastic as I will get about poetry. Um, I'm not usually that enthusiastic, but it I just needed to write out the whole thing. Um, it is technically a novella because it is no it has the word count for a novella and it's being classified as a novella, but it's also a very long poem. Yeah, I guess um, I don't know some, sometimes some of these things I guess is sort of almost more a question of how they're marketed than, than what the thing itself actually is. Um, but which I guess is sort of can be an interesting thing to think about. I, one of the things that I found really, um, interesting, uh, is that, so you're like a science fiction and fantasy writer, that sort of writing community, uh, isn't one that is sort of widely thought of as having a lot of intersection with the poetry community. Um, but you like when you know you look at your bibliography like uh, you have a whole bunch of published poems and many of them are on sort of um themes or using uh imagery or tropes that are that are you know recognizable from the speculative fiction genre um and i just thought that was really fascinating it's not something that i have a lot of experience with i'm finding that <sighs> That's something that I think we in the speculative poetry community need to publicize more. 
because I do find that a number of readers are not aware of how many science fiction writers are also writing poetry. Mm -hmm. And I think the main examples that come to mind, uh, Joe Haldeman, for example, is an really? outstanding speculative. Yes, he's. I would call him probably one of the best speculative poets working in the field today. Almost wow. no one outside of the spec poetry field knows this, which I find very frustrating. Um, there are some people that know about Ursula Gwynn and Jane Yolen as two very well-known speculative poets, but again, those two tend to be much better known for their prose. Yeah, uh, interesting. When you have Jane Yolen is in the middle of doing a project right now where she writes a poem every single day and emails it. Hmm. Uh, I will say that her poems tend to because it's a daily thing they're not all brilliant you know <laughs> even jane yolen can't do that but she's that, that would be a pretty amazing. tall order yeah but she's done some amazing stuff while she's done that and i would personally argue and there are i have talked to people who disagree with me on this um but i think long term ursula Le Guin is going to be better known for her poetry than for some of her prose. interesting interesting what what makes you say that Largely because her poetry tends to be very groundbreaking. She and Margaret Atwood and a few others were among those that really began to say, hey, poetry has a long tradition of working with fantasy. Hmm. Let's play. And she did. You can see this in the Earthsea books in particular, where she talks about the importance of language and the importance of words and how words really become magic. And she interweaves bits of poetry into the prose there. She's also done some other poetry collections. She's worked with, um, she's done some work with some ancient poetry that she's uh, rewritten and reused in English. Um, and again, this tends to be some of her less known work. Hmm. Uh, uh, Margaret Atwood did the same thing um, with a book about um, the Odyssey where she took she looked at the point of view of the woman. And again, not one of her better known works, but it's out there. So I think, and I include myself here, um, we really, those of the rest of us that are working in the speculative poetry community, really need to work on getting the word out there <laughs> about how <laughs> exciting this field is, um, how many people are working on it, in it, and how many people are doing both poetry and fiction. Hmm. Uh, because it's not just me. Um, yes, I've done a lot of it, but uh, there are others. Uh, Lisa Bradley, certainly Rose Lemberg are coming to mind. And I would, should have had a much longer list of this. But, um, oh, what is her? Why am I blanking on her name? Uh, she's a recent award winner. Sophia Samatar. Oh, okay. Uh, the recent award winner who has done extensive work in groundbreaking poetry recently. So, again, there's a lot of stuff out there, but we have not done a very good job of promoting it. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, like poetry in general, um, I've talked to several other poets for, for this show before, never speculative poets, but um, I mean, poetry in general, I feel like has sort of a, you know, like reading, like books in general, I feel like oftentimes um, a lot of people talk about how it's hard to get a certain level of engagement with, with um, literature or any type of of writing as opposed to, you know, what goes on television and then poetry, especially compared to novels or, you know, biographies or whatever might have even less engagement or, or sort of popularity. Um, and that's sort of always a, seems to always be a very perennial topic of conversation and, or, or hand wringing or whatever, but that, um, it kind of seems like, like this particular genre of poetry. Uh, one of the things I wonder is, um, like, do you find that, that as a, as a speculative poet that you, um, like engage much or have engagement from the sort of non-speculative poetry community or, or is that, is there like a tension there or, or, or anything like that? I wouldn't call it attention, but I would say that we're not really communicating well with all of those groups either. Um, now, I have written and published quite a bit in the non-speculative poetry world as well, mm -hmm. uh, just not under the name of Maureen Ness. And it's been a while, but I did some of the big literary uh, poetry journals. I think one of the big differences is that in what I would call more of the lit poetry world, mm -hmm. those poems are not paid. 
Uh, there's often a lot of reading fees involved. Uh, there's a number of different, I don't want to use the word dubious poetry contests, mm. but it does bug me a little bit when there's a $50 reading fee to get into the contest. When I know that there are ways to get your poems published without having to pay reading fees. Mm. Uh, so in that sense, there's a bit of tension with me personally <laughs> looking <laughs> at some of these, uh, you know, to contests and going, Oh man, we, we don't need to do this. But at the same time, that's how the more literary side of poetry has often worked. Mm. I will also say that in this there are some journals within speculative poetry that are producing work that I would argue is up to the standards of rattle or poetry or the work that you're finding in the New Yorker. Uh, and rattle poetry in the New Yorker all do publish speculative uh, poems. Hmm. So oh, there's a little bit more of an interconnection there than I think people are necessarily aware of. Hmm. That said, one thing that I have found is like the poetry community here in Orlando tends to focus in two different areas. One is religious poetry, which um, I don't tend to write much, but there is a very active uh, Christian poetry group here in Orlando hmm. uh, that does do regular poetry readings. Um, and then there is another poetry group um, that seems to be doing, I have not been to their readings, so I'm just based on what I see from their announcements. They seem to be focusing more on the lit track. They're the, I, I don't, issue is a strong word. That group has not reached out to me or to other speculative poets that are writing in, in the Florida area. And I'm like, hey, guys, I actually get paid money for my poems, mm -hmm. which shocked them. Hmm. They were they were stunned and I'm like, yes, it's a token amount. Yes, it's not, uh, poetry is not necessarily the place we're going to be earning money, but Yes, you can get paid for poetry if you are looking at other journals and other fields. Um, so, and with all that said, I wanted to kind of end this with saying I don't think there's as much of a gap between lit and litter poetry and spec poetry as some people would like to see. I think, you know, we can switch fields fairly easily. Mm -hmm. um, I don't have a problem with going and getting an MFA in poetry and writing poems about uh, speculative fiction and uh, dragons and what have you. So, yeah. And that's that happening. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, I think it like there's, um, you know, even with, even with, you know, prose fiction, there's, there's often sort of, um, um, there can be an attitude among literary fiction writers and, and sort of the literary publishing industry that, um, that, that treats genre fiction as sort of somehow sort of less credible or less legitimate as an art form. And uh, I've seen that, and I'm here on the other side. You can't see me, but I'm clenching my fists <laughs> because <laughs> I've seen that. It always makes me just um, start to scream because if you are looking, and admittedly my background is more with Western literature, but mm -hmm. looking at the history of Western literature, we started out with speculative fiction. The Epic of Gilgamesh is speculative. <laughs> Greek mythology, Roman myths, all of this stuff, speculative. Um, so, and it, it did not stop there. Some of the initial Western literature was all focused on stories of King Arthur, which, you know, everybody's making up. Uh, Shakespeare certainly wrote uh, fantasy. So to have this, ooh, um, there's this break between, you know, literary, hardcore, realistic uh, fiction and oh there's that fantasy genre stuff it i i clench my fists <laughs> yeah it's sort of a, an interesting thing too i mean i agree with you that there's a lot less distance between the two than sort of is maybe popularly admitted i think it's very interesting how like if you look at somebody like kurt vonnegut or or um like uh more recently um Ishiguro, uh, writing things that are very obviously speculative, but they don't get marketed that way or labeled that way necessarily. Um, or meanwhile, like on the other side, I don't know, somebody, I mean, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, uh um, speculative fiction out there that is, uh, that has pro style that is, you know, as, as literary as anything that you could want, um, doesn't necessarily get the same recognition, um, it, 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 it certainly, you know, 
it frustrates me a little bit, and I'm just a, a reader in in that. So, I, yeah. I mean, to mention, not to make this entire podcast about Sophia Samatar, but she would definitely uh, be on that. That yes, she's writing extremely literary prose. She's classified as a speculative fiction writer, but her prose is, I would say, highly literary. Mm-hmm. Um, that would be my. When I read it, I was thinking this very much. I would uh, is something that classifies as literary literary fiction. Mm-hmm. And yet, if you check the book bookstores, she's classified under speculative fiction. Right. Right. I mean, in some ways, it seems like a lot of the categorization is really less about the art of it and more about the the business of it, just because, Mm -hmm. you know, and I can see that argument. It does, you know, readers like to know what to expect. So that makes it easier to sell things. And we do all have to sell, sell the things in order to be able to continue, you know, having a publishing industry. I get that, but it it can be frustrating for sure. So one of the things that I, I also... Um, you know, noted when I was, uh, I'm sure you get this question a lot, but, or just that, um, it seems like you have both in your poetry and in, in your, um, your short fiction, uh, like an interest in, in taking, um, fairy tales and mythology and sort of, um, slanting them or, or reimagining them, subverting them in some way. Um, and I, I, I found myself really responding to, to uh how you how you do that in in many of your your pieces um i'm not sure exactly how i would phrase it as a question but it's something that i found really interesting about your work um particularly there was a thing in um you know it's pretty close to the beginning of through mortal shadows singing um i actually took a screenshot of it let me see if i can find it um the, in, in one of the first poems, there's a thing where Helen is uh, talking about how um, how people talk about her as this thing in relationship to men, but um, but nobody really nobody ever talks in their stories about the. Let me see. Here it is. More is told of this than the golden home I formed in Sparta, the home I built with my hands and voice. I, I thought that was really. Um, like that, the, the opportunity to revise our understanding of these characters just seems like a really exciting one, um, to me anyway. <laughs> I like doing it partly because when I was a kid and I first started interacting with these tales, I always wanted more, or I wanted to know like, well, what did the dwarfs really think when Snow White showed up, which is, uh, I do have a couple of stories on that, uh, which haven't made it into publication yet. Uh, and, you know, what happened to the glass coffin, all th- sorts of things like that. But I also find that there's so much more to tell in these fairy tales. When it came to Helen of Troy in particular, I did do a lot of research while I got more and more involved in these poems and this long poem that kept going and going and going. And I was fascinated by how much of the myth did not quite translate into what we usually know about Helen today, including the myth that she was responsible for founding quite a lot of Sparta, <laughs> which is there. And the, if you are looking at the original Greek myth, there are comments about that. There are some statues, there are some other things, but it tends not to be in the typically told tale of what did Helen do? Because we tend to look at her now more as, well, she caused the war. Mm. So we talk about what did she cause rather than what did she create. And so that I found was something that I really want to talk about is what is her perspective on this? And then her voice kept talking. So I kept going and that's how I ended up with 185 pages of a poem <laughs> about, about Ellen of Troy, which was not the original intent. That was not what I, I was going for, you know, a couple of short poems. And it, as I said, it got out of hand, but mm. Yeah, I felt that there was a lot more to tell there, and I think that's true for a number of other fairy tales and a number of other myths. Yeah, I mean, I, I just a couple of the ones that that um, that I pulled out here to note: uh, the witch in the tower. You're sort of looking at the Rapunzel story, um, and there's a flash, like a very short flash fiction piece called Souls, where it's, uh, if I'm correct, it's about the Little Mermaid. Um, it's kind of her sisters. Yeah, and and 
and it really um the thing that especially you know having read a bunch of these sort of right in a row um what really sticks out to me is like you know it's uh, a lot there are so many um legends and myths and fairy tales that involve female characters but um the way that they're represented or the way that we talk about them or the way that they function in the story is very often um you know more as a uh uh like a like a set piece almost to 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 set against uh, a male character and obviously this is some this is a problem that um and exists in in all in all different kinds of stories contemporary and and um and older ones but it's something that i feel like in um with with these stories is not something that gets uh interrogated uh in the sort of wider discussion as much and so having this opportunity to do that through recontextualizing and deepening these stories is really a, an interesting thing and it's something i don't seem to be able to stop doing <laughs> <laughs> so i'll start right like yeah that interesting what was that person actually thinking in that particular fairy tale um, especially some of the side, sometimes it's the main characters, but I find myself less interested by Cinderella and Snow White and Rapunzel and much more by all of the people they interacted with. Mm-hmm. Uh, certainly with Rapunzel, you kind of really have to think, what was that witch thinking? What was she expecting? Uh, and there's a lot more that seems to be going on in the background of that tale than the what we get when we're only looking at it as Rapunzel is an object for the prince to find, Hmm. Uh, which is often how the story is told. I wanted to know. So thus my, uh, yes, thus the witch in the tower, which is the witch's perspective more on what's going on with Rapunzel. Yeah. I remember I was having a conversation with a a friend of mine who's, uh, who's uh, also writes a lot of short fiction. Um, and he was talking about, how when he watches movies a lot of times he gets really obsessed with the characters that are just sort of standing around in the background and sort of inventing stories for them and it i mean it seems like a pretty similar impulse um and it's one that that at the time i was just thinking to myself like that that is a a a pretty powerful um, imaginative impulse that that you have there that I i don't think a lot of people do that you know you know, it depends. I'm on a couple of fan forums for some terrible television shows, and then we'll just pretend, um, well, I'll add Game of Thrones in here. And I'm very much surprised by how many of the smaller characters have gained some passionate fan bases. Mm. And I'll very specific, because this one is odd. Um, on the television show Arrow, there are two television reporters that have been on the show since season one. All they do is report the news and occasionally show up for interviews. And there is actual fan fiction. There is speculation. There is a, uh, I wouldn't say obsession, but these are, I mean, these two characters are completely blank slates. We know nothing about them except that they report the news. And I think because of that, there are some viewers that have suddenly gotten obsessed with what are these people doing staying in a city where arrows are flying and there's terrorist attacks every year and high drama and people making stupid decisions and, all kinds of stuff because the show gives us no information about that. Um, and from a Game of Thrones perspective, I've been surprised at some of the minor characters that become huge fan favorites and where viewers have said, we want to see more of these characters. They're more interesting to us than Jon Snow continually knowing nothing. You know, we've <laughs> seen that. <laughs> you know, we're in seven seasons of, or however many seasons we are in Game of Thrones, I forget, but... Lots of seasons of Jon Snow knowing nothing. Let's take a look at some of the more minor characters. Yeah, that is something that is such a great point. And it's I, it's something I really hadn't thought of um, that um, that there is this really long tradition in the fanfic community of doing this. Um, and what's interesting is so the context of that I was so the, the, the writer that I was talking to before, his name's Brandon Taylor. Um, and I, I we were talking about this on, on a previous episode of the show. Um, but, you know, and he mostly uh writes you know more literary stories rather than speculative stories um what that brings to mind for me is how how different the uh 
audience interaction and engagement with fiction can be, um, depending on the genre, that you just don't seem to... I mean, I'm sure it happens, but it doesn't seem to be as much of a phenomenon in the literary reading community to to um, to do that kind of thing and 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 build so much and i that's really interesting i really never thought about that hmm. yeah i think it, it's been an interesting reaction to a lot of genre shows um i'm not really involved in fanfic uh so i'm not really that aware of that community but i'm interested in how much more obsessed people will get over theories and ideas and characters and what have you in something like game of thrones versus this is perhaps not the best example, but um, NCIS also has a huge viewership. Mm -hmm. And yet you're not getting, or at least I'm not hearing about, it's possible it's out there and I'm just not aware of it, the same level of fan engagement with whoever the minor characters of NCIS are. Mm -hmm. And, yeah, I think that's partly because I, you know, there isn't quite as much of, you know, Will a dragon be coming and eating the entire uh, cast of NCIS? <laughs> it's not really one of their chief concerns, but you you don't quite see it happening, or at least I have not seen or heard of it happening at the same level um, on some of the Law and Orders and NCIS. Now, having said that, somebody's going to come along and point me to a whole bunch of NCIS fan fiction that I had no idea existed. So I could be incredibly wrong about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, it it is interesting. I mean, and, and even there. Um, you know, NCIS is a pretty, uh, popular, like popular in terms of, you know, of the people kind of show, which is something that I, I feel like, um, is often a big dividing line between the literary and, and genre fiction communities that the literary community can be a, a more elitist in that way. And I, and I, I guess I kind of wonder if, you know, the, that that might drive a little bit of the difference between, the the way that people engage with the work. I mean, even just the term fan um, is not used as much for, you know, somebody like William Faulkner as it would be for, you know, somebody like George Martin. So, um, yeah, interesting, interesting. I, have... I would say that there's also quite a bit of elitism in the speculative community in terms of what's more elite or, you know, what's, so it's not exactly that it's gone there. I've certainly encountered a lot of that at various conventions or in conversations about, well, you know, this is really superior literary fiction in these, and I've done it myself to an extent in speculative fiction versus, oh, that, you know, urban fantasy stuff, you know, the mm. vampires. Whatever. And so I won't, I can't even really say that we in the speculative fiction community are completely free of that because I've certainly seen it. Yeah, that's true. That's a good point. Um and 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 definitely there are that that plays out in a lot of different ways. Hmm. So <clears throat> uh that one of the things that I uh that I also noted that about, you know, reading through some of your work is that you do have a fair number of extremely short pieces that would qualify as flash fiction pieces. Um and that's another th phenomenon that, um, like I, I'm sure it existed before I was aware of it, but it wasn't something that I was really aware of as a, a thing, like as a, a big genre or classification of, of, of literature, um, until maybe like four or five years ago. And then now all of a sudden it seems like it's everywhere. Um, and I was just sort of wondering, like, what do you, for you as the writer, what do you, what do you find to be the sort of the appeal of writing in an extremely short form versus writing in in you know because you also have p pieces that are that are that are you know pretty decently long as well so you know it, it it seems like you run the gamut what do you, what's the what do you find to be I don't know sort of the payoff as a writer to to one or the other. This is a complicated question for me to answer because a lot of this has to do with the fact that I'm also dealing with two different chronic illnesses. Mm. And one thing that works for me with flash fiction is it's something that I can write and within a specific amount of time and not have to worry that, oh, no, um, 
either a very bad attack of vertigo or an attack of um, of uh, cyclic vomiting syndrome is hitting, and now I've forgotten the push of the story. So that, for me, physically <laughs> is one of the reasons why I'm doing flash fiction. Mm-hmm. Um, there's also the fact that doing a flash fiction story can give you an immediate, aha, I finished something today uh, story, although... That said, there's been a couple of flash fiction stories I haven't been able to really nail in a day, so I don't always get that feeling. Hmm. So it's that feeling of satisfaction. There's the fact that I personally can do it. Um, There's also, right now, when you were talking about how you only became aware of flash fiction within the last four years, I would tend to agree with that. Um, I'm not saying that it wasn't published before. There is at least one collection out there that was published in the 1980s um, that was something like the 100, 100 greatest short, short stories ever sold. Mm. So it's being published. But the market was not there in the same way that it is now. Uh, right now, there are publications that are actively looking for and searching for flash fiction which I don't think was something that we could really say, it, it, certainly not in the 1990s. I mean, it would be published, but it was hard to find a place that would take it. Uh, when I started submitting stuff, um, again, in what I call my third try at this <laughs> as a writer, uh, in the mid-2000s, uh, 2006, 2007, just a few places were accepting it. Now it seems that more and more publications are actively looking for it. So that's also a change in the sense of if I write a short, short story, I have a pretty good chance of getting it published, which is not necessarily true of a longer short story. Hmm. At least for me. Hmm. Uh, so there's that. And then there's just the – it's challenging to try to get it down to something that really packs a punch in a, shoe, in a few words, and that's fun. That's like, wow, I did it. So I like that as well. I like the the word challenge of it. I like a lot of, um, so it's it for me, it's fun. Yeah. I, I, I feel like um, reading some of your, your flash pieces, there's a very lyrical quality, and it was sort of making me think of like the fact that you do poetry as well as prose, um, that... Um, like there again, and like the, the, the distance between those two forms isn't necessarily as broad as, as, you know, we might initially think. Um, and it seemed like from a craft perspective that, you know, one thing that, that poets have to do, I mean, typically, especially most, I mean, most, most poems are maybe a page or two at the, at the most, but, um, you know, that you have to be very efficient with your language, um, and, uh, whereas, you know, someone who's writing a novel that needn't necessarily have to do that, but with flash fiction, you have that same, um, sort of constraint, um, that would requires a certain economy of language that, um, that, that seems like it would, um, it would involve more, um, more craft and, and a greater exercise of craft than, um, then I think, I mean, I think people are recognizing it now, but maybe like five or six years ago, it wouldn't have been something that people would have necessarily recognized. Do you, do you, do you think that? Yeah, I would. And I, if I recall, it's, it's been a long time since I've read that 100 greatest short stories under whatever it was under a thousand words or short shorts. Um, but many of the stories in there were jokes, which, Yes, is true of some of the flash stuff I've done as well, but we didn't see as many attempts to create story within that short, short form. Hmm. And now I think we're seeing a little bit more of that, primarily because, again, some of the markets that are now, it, I don't want to say this is all publication driven, but if you are going to sell a flash fiction story to, say, Fireside, Fireside wants a plot of hmm. some sort. Uh, fires. So you're not just, and they don't just want a joke. They want a little bit more there. So you have to do a bit more than the joke or the quick twist ending or something like that that would have been part of flash fiction it, that was collected in that uh, book years back. So, mm. yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, uh, well, I mean, why don't we? take a little break. We've been going about a half an hour now. Why don't we take a little break and we'll come back and do the second segment. Sounds good. 
So for the second segment, I always ask the guests to bring a topic of their own, which can be anything you'd like to talk about, whatever's on your mind. So what would you like to talk about today? Well, I figured this time it would be, and it sort of goes along with the topic we were doing earlier, some of the, not the topic, but some of the things that were coming up uh, in an earlier conversation, which would be Lucy Mama Montgomery, uh, who was uh, author of Anne of Green Gables, mm. but not really Anne of Green Gables, um, because I'm much more interested in everything else that she wrote. <laughs> so, uh, she is, she was a Canadian author, primarily known, uh, as I said, for Anna Green Gables, mm -hmm. which is not her best work. It's not her most profound work, and it's not the work that I would urge people to read. Um, what I found much more fascinating with her as a writer was when her journals started coming out about 20 years ago revealing that this was a woman with an absolutely fascinating life in that she starts off trapped in this little farm community in Canada. And then she decides she can't take her life as a teacher anymore being trapped. So she's going to go ahead and marry her second cousin, a minister, but he physically repels her. So, and, and it just, she's falling in love with this farmer who thrills her who she keeps having all these forbidden kisses with until he asks her this one statement whose meaning cannot be denied. It's incredibly Victorian, incredibly over the top, and I was totally enthralled. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I kept reading her journals. There's five volumes of them, and once you get past the original, the first few years, which is teenage angst to the max, that's not very good. It They get interesting <laughs> once you have to get past her first teenage years. After that, uh, she marries a completely different minister. Um, World War One hits. She has the Canadian at-home perspective on World War One. She loses her best friend. Her husband goes insane. And these books continue on. The and you, I the fourth journal they became more difficult to read because by this point, after reading three three journals that were very intimate, very detailed about her life. When you watch her going into more and more severe depressions in Journal 4, as her husband gets more and more insane and her son, uh, she begins realizing her son is a sociopath. And in fact, her journals, as a later biographer pointed out, her journals very much censored most of the stuff that her oldest son was getting up to. Uh, he ended up in jail and ended up just being a, a complete hor and horrible person. And then Journal 5 is really depressing because that was a journal where she begins marching towards su suicide. So I can't really recommend all five volumes of her journals because I found personally that the last two volumes were very difficult to read. Mm -hmm. But the first three volumes and her other books I found were a fascinating look at a 20, early 20th century woman's writer and what she was doing as she fought to get literary recognition, especially after writing a best-selling book. Hmm. Because part of her problem was because her first book was such a bestseller, was so well-known, and was humorous comedy. It's a funny book she found herself dismissed by other more. And what we were discussing in terms of that uh, literary world, the literary world tended to dismiss her. Mm. So she fought back by trying to write more and more serious books, while at the same time, because her insane husband was a minister, and she was a minister's wife, there was a limit to what she felt she could actually write. Mm. So she's getting this pressure from her literary colleagues in the 1920s and 1930s that are saying we need to write very realistic fiction, which she felt she could not do because minister's wife. But you see her trying to follow many of the different literary trends. For example, she wrote a stream of consciousness novel, Magic for Marigold, that was very much attempting to imitate the work of James Joyce, the work of Virginia Woolf, showing that she was still very much involved in the literary community while continually being dismissed from it. Mm. And while looking at that, I was fascinated 
this will be something. If I keep talking too much, just interrupt me. If I'm, if I'm <laughs> no, getting this is great. About this because as I was reading and as I was looking at these books, I found that she could be very much connected to two other very popular British writers, hmm. Georgette Heyer and Agatha Christie, hmm. who did pretty much the same thing. They were writing these popular books, finding themselves dismissed, and so they turned around and tried to write this very literary fiction. And in the case of Georgette Heyer, those books were just not selling. So Heyer mostly gave up and proceeded to establish a genre fiction uh, um, Regency romance. She was the person that pretty much that entire group of novels, which right now is making a number of publishers a lot of money, hmm. would not have existed without George at Hire saying, I can't do this literary fiction. It's not the work that I'm doing here and these stream of consciousness novels I'm trying to write are not selling and I need to provide for my family. So I'm going to write these frothy, lightweight romance novels instead and then ends up founding, founding a literary genre. And then you have Agatha Christie, who actually did all of her literary work under a completely different name. Hmm. Yeah, it's an interesting thing, too. Um, like, like I can I can imagine, I did not have really any um, awareness of Lucy Maud Montgomery's other other books. Um, uh, in our, my, my wife's family is Canadian, and so uh, the Anne of Green Gables books are, <clears throat> sort of a big deal in in her family um but uh but but yeah i i had never really had any awareness um that she had even actually written other books which is certainly uh a failure on my part of you know doing any research at all <laughs> but um i think it's an interesting thing to to sort of consider how like two things came up to me when when as you were you're saying that 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 one um how um you know writers from marginalized communities and uh, um you know including women are very routinely dismissed um unless they're writing in a real specific box um and you know that obviously continues up to today uh in in many ways um and then also how how it like you know thinking about somebody like Agatha Christie or 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 Lucy Maud Montgomery having um these maybe aspirations to do a certain artistic thing that the artistic community at the time didn't allow them to do and then now are not they're not really recognized for those things that maybe um, they might have wanted to do, but that also at the same time, the things that they are recognized for, um, and that people, uh, you know, uh, you know, widely associate with them. Um, I mean, both of them are household names that have, you know, their work has, has meant a great deal to, you know, untold millions of readers. Um, you can only, I can only imagine how many, how many young people would have read, read, um, you know, Anne of Green Gables or any number of um, Agatha Christie mystery novels. And, and that was what propelled them to want to become writers themselves. I think that consideration of artistic legacy is a really, it's a really fascinating thing, especially if it may not have necessarily aligned with what they wanted when they were alive. Well, there's a couple of things there that to go off on what you're saying that are interesting in that no one studied Lucy Ma Montgomery or took her seriously until these journals started to appear. Hmm. And suddenly it was, oh, she didn't just write Anne of Green Gables, this very funny, very hopeful, um, very hopeful novel, very um, bright and happy novel. Although there's some dark undercurrents to Anne of Green Gables, I think, tend to go under-recognized. But oh look, she did write realistic nonfiction. Look how serious. Look, she she did do all of this very serious journaling. Now we can begin to take her seriously. Now we can use her as an object of literary study, which still is something that has not happened as much with Agatha Christie. Even though Agatha Christie wrote a nonfiction autobiography, and she's still the best-selling woman author, pretty much, or author period. Hmm. 
and still gets very limited academic study given her prominence and given the number of people that have read her books. Mm -hmm. The other other thing in terms of inspiration uh, with Lucy Montgomery in particular, I wouldn't say the Anne of Green Gables books weren't a huge inspiration for me as an author. I loved them when I was a kid and I read them. But Montgomery's other series, uh, Emily of New Moon, is about a young girl growing up on a Canadian farm, much like Anna Green Gables. Um, but Emily wants to become a writer. This is what drives her. And it's a trilogy of books about Emily growing up to be a writer. It is This genuinely was an inspiration for me, in part because it is told realistically in the sense that Emily does not get immediate help or satisfaction or support. She sends out her little poem. She sends out her short stories. They get rejection slips. They get rejection slips. They get rejection slips. Uh, her first novel um, is not treated well by her community. It's not until her second novel that finally she begins to get some recognition. But that novel, again, goes through the standard rejection slip, rejection slip, rejection slip. And I think this is really one of the earliest examples that I can think of in let's say, young adult fiction or even children's fiction that shows that progress as a writer. Hmm. Uh, Because the the other book that came to mind would be something like Louisa May Alcott, where in Little Woman, you know, Louisa May Alcott writes her first couple of short stories, and they do get picked up. And (laughs) And her criticism that she gets is all, oh, you shouldn't be writing sensationalist fiction. You need to, you know, it's very bad for you, and there's a lot of of stuff going on in Little Woman, uh, particularly in the second half of the book, that I have some deep problems with. But you don't have the same realistic approach to writing in Little Woman that you do in Lucy Ma Montgom- Ma- Ma- Montgomery's books, particularly those Emily of New Moon uh, books, those three, which I definitely found were inspiration and still remain inspiring for me as a writer, just mm. because of how the books are approached. Mm. And I would also say that that series as a whole is, it, um, should warn people that the last book was not one of her better books. But the first two books, I think, are better than the uh, books of the Anne Green Gable series. Mm. It's an interesting thing, you know, I feel like, um, you know, both with, someone like Lucy Ma Montgomery and and certainly with Agatha Christie that so much of um what the sort of critical establishment or the academic um attention um or or sort of the uh, the, the perception of their li- literary legitimacy is like so many things very it's it it seems like it, it's obvious or that that um, that because they are women writers who are writing books that are primarily being read by women or by girls, that that in itself automatically would disqualify them from being taken seriously as writers, as artists. Um, and there's definitely, there's a real condescension, especially um, like even now, there's, I find this really, this real condescension towards um art that is made with young people in mind um and especially young women in mind um i remember i was having a conversation with a friend of mine um who she had recommended this book to me that was um is called archivist wasp um oh yes um yes i do know the book yeah um she had recommended this book to me and so i went looking for it and i went to the my my um, local independent. We have this great independent bookstore here in San Diego called uh, Mysterious Galaxy that it, it just does science fiction, fantasy, horror, and mystery. And um, and I love them. I was looking for this book in, and I went and looked for it in just the regular um, science fiction and fantasy section, but I couldn't find it. And then when they f- they found it for me, it was in the YA section. And then and I said, oh, okay, it was just my mistake. When I read it, I was thinking to myself, what is it about this book that makes it YA? And 
and we were talking about it, my friend and I, um, her name's Dawn. Um, it's, it's, it's really just that it's written by a woman featuring a young woman protagonist. But other than that, like it, there's nothing about that book that's like, obviously this is written, you know, like this is not a serious work of, of fiction. You know I mean? It's, it's, there are parts of that book that are, that are kind of brutal in fact. Um, but it just kind of really reinforced to me this sort of condescension that we have as a society towards both women writers, women readers, and young readers in general. Um, it's very frustrating. And we, yeah, and we do, I mean, really, Lucy Ma Montgomery is virtually the poster child for this because when Anna Green Gables was first published, it was not marketed towards children. Mm. And one of the first people to really praise it and to discover it was Mark Twain. With Agatha Christie, you have a number of men, uh, who prominent politicians, who were discussing how much they liked her books and how they always carried Agatha Christie uh, books with them. So it's definitely, yes, there are men and adults reading these books, and yet somehow or other, with Agatha Christie, I think the situation is a bit different because they tend to get dismissed as, oh, those are just mystery novels. Uh, with Lucy Ma Montgomery, it's definitely, oh, well, she only wrote about young girls. Well, she wrote about young girls, but in many of her books, she had those girls grow up, and she wrote about what happened to them afterwards. So it was not that that was her, that she was limited to writing about young girls. And even in those books, she really did not intend them for a audience of just young girls. And she was infuriated when that was where her books began to get relegated to mm. because of who the protagonist was. And she made her attempts at writing fiction starring older women uh, one of those books, she had some problems with a British publisher because, oh, well, you know, these are all older characters. <laughs> we, you know, you, you write younger characters, uh, and it's an early, uh, 1930s example of you're trying to break out of your, you know, genre bo uh, box. Mm -hmm. yeah. There were, you know, and there, there were a couple of other books that, she, uh, so there was an, another book, uh, Pad of Silver Bush that she went to after being told that her adult books were a bit difficult to uh, promote. And that book then got dismissed, and I think rightly, for being overly depressing. And that's definitely one of her worst books. You can skip it. Uh, so it was kind of like she, could, she couldn't win either way. Uh, and she would also get yelled at for not tempering her writing to the expected the audience. Uh, you see this in Rilla of Ingleside where her American publishers had a virtual heart attack because Rilla of Ingleside is telling the story of World War I from the Canadian point of view. And therefore, it contains a number of statements, particularly in the full version, that are extremely anti-American. Very specifically criticizing Woodrow Wilson, saying that Yankees suck, going on and on about how terrible the U.S. is and how they've landed, come in the last minute and all of this other stuff, which got very much edited out of most American editions of the book. Uh, I was very surprised when I finally had a chance to read the full book and saw all of the comments and context and said, wow, yeah, this book is not overly kind to Americans. Hmm. Publishers were furious, and she was like, I didn't write the book from an American perspective. I'm Canadian. This is a Canadian book. And yes, Americans came in late to World War I. Uh, there's not, you know, this is, so she was writing the Canadian point of view there, which was not really what the American audience wanted. So it got severely edited in most U.S. editions, hmm. which, um, so you have that in terms of her publishers editing her. You also have some of her scholars and even her biographers editing her because one of the other things that happens in her journals that and to a certain extent you can see this in her novels it's interesting is she fell in love with a woman cousin but because she was very victorian and very sexually repressed in a number of ways she couldn't admit to this but after the cousin died she continues to mourn the cousin every single year extensively 
Mm. She went into major depression. Her husband also went into a depression, I think, because of after seeing how much his wife reacted to the death of this cousin. Um, there are other cases where you can see reading between the lines and also in terms of what people remembered from uh, Montgomery was that she would get crushes and she would get strong and passionate feelings towards women. And yet her main biographer, who was doing many of these interviews and was editing the journals, was all, oh, no, no, no. Montgomery was clearly just purely straight. She, nope, nope, never. <laughs> and yet I'm reading the text of this going, I, I cannot read this text as purely straight. I cannot read her as a lesbian either because Montgomery very clearly had very strong attraction to men as well. Mm. But there is a tendency to, for certain scholars or certain of her readers to look at her works through a certain glass and not necessarily see everything there or read it. I guess we could just say reading it differently than I do. I find it extremely difficult to read Montgomery um, as a straight writer, but her main biographer who spent all of this time studying and re reviewing and researching her does read her as straight. Hmm. So I think there's that going on, too, in terms of looking at marginalized contexts. Yeah. And it's so um, it's such a strange thing and obviously happens so often, though, just how, um, you know, how how people sort of refuse to sort of take um, artists or art as what they are or like that they have to kind of. You know, I mean, if they're like, it's, I haven't read the things that you're reading, re, that you're talking about, but, but I mean, it sounds to me like that there's plenty of evidence to read it from a queer perspective. And, and, but, and, and, it, you know, the way that it comes off for the biographer to deny that evidence would be just that it has to, you know, that, that, that he would be unable to, still view her as a legitimate subject for biography if that were the case um and it's just such a on the on the there's, one hand hmm? yeah well there's also in that particular case there tends to be a binary between a author has to be either gay and lesbian or straight right and failing to see that well there is this other alternative um because the argument oh montgomery couldn't possibly have been queer or have any lesbian thoughts is look how many times she talks about being attracted to men that's mm -hmm. absolutely true she's very clearly very attracted to men she married a guy i don't you know this is all the, the this is all facts that we can look at but at the same time, that doesn't mean she didn't also have feelings towards women. And I think had she lived, you know, another 100, 150 years later, uh, she certainly would have expressed those feelings in a different way because it would have been more socially permissible for her to do so. Uh, she was in a community that just did not allow that. but yeah. And therefore, she did not allow herself to think that way. But there are a number of incidents in her life that say, yeah, I think she was what I would call a very repressed bisexual, but definitely there. Yeah. Yeah. It's such a tragedy to think about, you know, that how, how people, um, in that time period and even today, how people, um, you know, are unable to, to live honestly, um, live their sort of honest, authentic selves, um, uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, uh, I, yeah, I, I didn't mean to get this into such a downer note <laughs> at the end there, but yeah, it was, um, frustrating to read, fascinating yeah. to read, but frustrating to read as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely fascinating. Um, so the last question that I, that I like to ask everyone is, uh, is, whether there is a piece of art or literature or just general creativity that you've experienced recently that meant something to you? Ah, uh, recently. Um, well, I just finished up Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim for the first time, and I was fascinated by this uh, book. 
And by the first time I was reading it while the power was out because I have it in a hard copy mm. for, um, I am going to be writing an essay about the film version of that soon. Uh, but the book version really fascinated me because I don't know if you've read the book, but I have it, I've and, seen the movie, but not, not read the book. Yeah, it's, it's a, it's an old book. Um, but very much about how even super intelligent mice rats that are specifically designed to be different from other mice and rats still need community. Mm. And I was fascinated by the way this book pushed for community while discussing the ways pe- people, or in, well, in this case, rats and mice, were very much hiding their true selves. And I thought, wow, this is a much better book than I was expecting it to be, uh, frankly. <laughs> and I shouldn't. I should be over the automatic um, dismissing of what you were discussing. Hey, it's a kid's book. We can dismiss it. I found it very moving. And mm. I thought, okay, this is a really, really good book. That just came to mind because, as I said, I read it yesterday when the power was out. Mm. Um, uh, in terms of other more recent books, too, help people out i am going to go ahead and plug a friend here sure uh because she's and i'm going to grab her books that i pronounce and i feel bad because i don't know how to pronounce her book Hmm. but this is uh laura donnelly uh and it's amber low it's her first book i love this this is gay people it is spies it is uh all kinds of (laughs) i i got incredible i don't know how much it necessarily emotionally moved me and everything but it was a really fun read. Uh, so there are spies, there are smugglers, there's cabaret dancers. I mean, it, it's amazing. So I am strongly recommending this book. Um, and that would be my uh, push for a friend. And yes, friend, so that's the disclaimer. But I like to think that I read it with a, um, uh, how do I put this unbiased eye? I guess not really, but it was just fun. Hmm. So that's my recommended book. Cool. Yeah, I will put a link in the show notes to that. So great. Thanks. And thanks for the recommendation on um, Mrs. Frisbee and the Rats of Nim. I'm always looking for stuff that I can read myself, stuff that I, and especially lately, I'm looking for stuff, um, you know, I have a a nine-year-old, a five-year-old, and a three-year-old. I'm always looking for new things that I can read with them. So that's uh, even better, especially if it's something that that, um, will give us something to talk about. So I think that's yeah. I would. I cannot recommend Amber Lowe for children uh, <laughs> at all. <laughs> it, it's really not that sort of book. Right. Uh, I, and I feel like as soon as oh, the other book that I w- that I've gotten very enthusiastic about was uh, Theodora Goss's, and I have to look up the name of the title, "The Strange Case of the Alchemist's Daughter." Hmm. Uh, this is basically the monsters of the 19th century for all women. Uh, so you have Frankenstein's Bride. For instance, uh, you have the woman from the Isle of Dr. Moreau. Uh, you have Rappacini's daughter all getting together to fight crime in London. Hmm. Uh, it was virtually written for me, I feel, <laughs> which is unfair because I, I really don't know uh, Theodora that well. But this was another really fun uh, book that I can highly recommend. Cool. Cool. Well, hey, thanks so much for talking to me. I really appreciate it. I had a good time. I did, too. This was fun. Okay, if you're interested in reading through Immortal Shadows Singing, I have put a link in the show notes, so do check that out, as well as her short stories. And that is our show. Uh, if you've got any questions or comments, you can email me at podcast at keepthechannelopen.com. You can also follow me in the show on Twitter at channelopenpod, or on Facebook at facebook.com slash keepthechannelopen. If you're enjoying the show and would like to help, please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. That helps new listeners find the show, and there is a link in the show notes for that. And if you really, really like the show, you can also subscribe to our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash sake river. That's patreon.com slash sake river, sake like the drink, and river like river. And a monthly pledge in any amount will not only get you my undying appreciation, it'll also get you access to each episode a day early. Our theme music is by Poddington Bear. You can find more of his music available for licensing at soundofpicture.com. Next time, our guest will be writer Sarah Gailey, so be sure to come back for that. And until then, remember, keep the channel open. (laughs) ¶¶